Good evening, and on this first Calypso Showcase for the year 1992, we wish to take the opportunity to wish you and yours a healthy and prosperous 1992. And we want to also assure you that we have a lot of good things lined up for you on Calypso Showcase this year. Well, our special guest tonight is none other than Winston Peters, the Gypsy. Some people call him the Michael Jackson of Calypso because of his trendy wear and because of his fancy footwork. But we know him also as the extempo champion. And we also remember him for winning that um, Calypso King of the World title in Barbados. Gypsy, welcome to Calypso Showcase. Thank you very much, Alvin. It's a pleasure being here. And to all my fans out there and friends, I'd like to wish them a very happy and prosperous 1992. Hope that everything works well for everybody and the country as a whole. How did you spend your whole year's night, by the way? Very quiet. Stayed home and relaxed. With the family? Yes. Well, so that's a nice way to <laughs> spend your place. Year. What was 1991 like for you? Hectic. Where did you go involved. to? Well, I went to a couple of places. I was in London, went to Brazil. To North America as usual, the regular thing, Canada, the Caribbean. And all in all, it was a real good year, you know. And you, you're a bit of an entrepreneur now. I <laughs> see you have your own gas station. How was that? That, that had a, a lot of work in it. Yeah, that, that's a lot of work. That's a lot of work. But I happen to, um, you know, to be able to cope with it, thank God. How is it now? Is it uh, completed in all respects? The station is completed, but one is never satisfied when you do business. Mm -hmm. I think you always look for things to get into and when you do one thing you always find that you have to change this and change that you know and it's always ever changing thing right, so you have a lot more to do in that area then of course well i know our viewers out there are anxious to see what the calypso <laughs> life of the gypsy is like so without any further ado we're going to take you to where it all began there yeah, have been times gone by when I watch mama cry and I know daddy hurt inside. Though he worked like a man, did all that he can, but somehow he just couldn't provide. A beautiful morning in my hour, Gypsy. Um, but the, the condition of the beach, the houses, the place surroundings, how does it compare to when you were a child here? Well, the grandeur is gone, definitely. There is, there is no way reflective of what it used to be. And tell us what it was like in those days. A beautiful place. Nice, well-kept houses that we used to be really proud of. I mean, I used to see literally thousands of people on this beach. And as a little boy, it provided a living for me. So it used to be really nice. A living in what way? Because they used to leave a lot of bottles and stuff in those days. And after they leave, it was my turn to party. I would take up all the bottles, and right across there used to be a Chinese shop. Just across there, right behind us. And I would sell them right there, and I would have a good bit of money in those times. Were you always an ambitious youngster? Well, I would, I, I, I would say self-praise don't have any, any recommendation, Alvin, but if I, if I have to say um, anything, I would say yes, because I always had a desire. I always had a, a vision, actually. It was never to stay here and be nothing. I always wanted to be something, you know. I, um, I was lucky that because when I was a little boy, Sparrow and, and Kitchener spent a lot of time in Mayaro. Yeah, and I was fortunate enough to, to hang out with them. And in some way wanted to be like them. Wanted to be like Sparrow more than anything else. Because he had this nice car and stuff. I really liked it. So I guess I wanted to be like that. And so what was your earliest involvement in Calypso? <laughs> um, all my life. All my life I started singing Calypso. From as long as I can remember. From my youth? Well, depending on what you call a youth, six, seven, yeah, that's... You're still that. a youth, right? <laughs> <laughs> a old youth. Yeah. Yeah. But six, seven, yeah. What are some of the calypsos that you would have sung at that early age? They're talking about brip, 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 br
And when they reached the hole, they head and ball, because when they think was mangoes, my branches for. <laughs> yes, those were the days, right? That was really, really early good. influences. That was the early, early influences. But in terms of your career starting, yeah. what would you say was the little trigger that got you started? When I started winning the Calypso Crown in, in Mayaro, it made me felt like I was somebody. Uh -huh. It make me it make me feel like I was somebody. And um, I wanted to move on, you know, to become even bigger. Can you remember any of the tunes that you sang in a competition in Mayaro that helped you to win one of the Mayaro crowns? Well, yeah, I remember, um, let me see. I have heard of Senator Kennedy since the early days of my birth. And I've learned that his bigger brother was the greatest president on earth. But through the fault of who my friend, most of us don't know. But through the fault of a trigger happy gunman, I don't remember the whole thing. We mourn to his life he lost. No, President Kennedy was a genius. Senator Kennedy was a boss. But through the fault of a trigger happy gunman, now we mourn to their lives they lost. I mean, that was a, that was a long time. I don't remember. Yeah, what year was that, more or less? I think it was 1968. Yeah. Uh -huh. But even, I mean, long before that, you know, I started, I started singing calypsos. The first thing I sang was even when I was in school, my own, you know, my own composition. Yeah. I made up, it was a composition, a competition for Junior Calypso King or whatever you may call it. And everybody else was singing everybody else's song. And I made up my own song. I was very small and it go like, Teresa was mad, once in Trinidad. She went to BG, she danced with a fry monkey. She went to Tobago, she danced with a male cobo. Now she eating some big rat, like a garapat. <laughs> no, I mean, no, it doesn't sound like anything. Yeah, but it does this. I mean, back then, I was Calypso King. The first time I knew you, obviously, was when you, you sang for King. Yes. Was that the first time you, have, you had hit Port of Spain and that was the first tune you did? That was the, no, that was my first time I hit Port of Spain. I had sung in Port of Spain the year before that. I did a song called Pica. So let me see. I have a big Pica. I pick from a pica tree when I was small But not a soul in the whole wide world Could ever get me to throw away me pica at all It's an offensive weapon but defense to me So not a soul mustn't interfere with gypsy I always have it to my command So I walk in with my long pica in my hand Tell us about that year Well that, that, that year was It was Victory Calypso 10 It was Victory Calypso 10, Lord Blakey Right. was the leader of the tent. In those days, Blakey, I mean, he was at the top of his, of, of his field. Nobody was as great as Blakey. I mean, when what you, year was that, actually? That was 1972. 72. 1972. 1972? When I did Pickham was 1972, yeah? So no, 73. no, no, no. When I did, when I did 4K, it was 1972. 72, yeah, right. right. And Blakey, I mean, he was, he was at the top of everything, and he had the tent. They heard me in Miaro. I was good and stuff, and, you know. Now give me a little taste of fucking. Just imagine that I can rule my own life Cause I really don't know how to rule my wife You imagine that I can rule my own life Cause I really don't know how to rule my wife Tell me what to do, I really don't know I never bounce up with a woman who like him so So I send she a buy, she pair and to stay and when I go to look for she leave your lady So I ask she ma For she I ask she pa For she But when I ask she old Granny The old lady said Sunny Monday Tuesday In terms of the popularity you achieved that year, the next 10 years, I saw a gypsy who was trying to find himself. This is the only way I could describe it. In terms of pleasing his public, but yet getting 
over to the public some of the material that was inside of him that he wanted to get across. Let's talk about those turbulent years from, I would say, 73 to 83, 84. Well, first of all, Alvin, at, um, I don't think that after Fort Kane in, in 1972 that I was really, really serious, let's, let's say, to the point where, you know, where I, where I really wanted to, to grasp at everything then, okay? Because I, I took some time off to go to school, actually. I used to come down to Trinidad in half of the season, you know, season already started. But I never missed any of it, you know, and I always had a good song. But I think it was after 1976, you know, after 1976 when I was out of school and all of that, that I really decided to make, you know, a real go at this thing. I mean, this is it. Tell us now about yeah. your experiences in Shadows 10. Well, I think to me, in all the 10s that I've ever sung in, in my life, Masters Den was the best experience. It, uh, we were like a family. We were really like a family, a close-knit one at that. It wasn't just like a regular Calypso tent that you have now. There was something much more than that. It was cro, -cro and Rio and funny and shadow and, you know, short pants. short pants later down and stuff. Yeah. But initially, you know, it was the, it was us. The hardcore. Yes, yes. And we all got along so well. To this day, these people I mentioned are still my best friends. Mm -hmm. You understand? They're still my best friends. All right. Now, I remember you coming out with a tune in 1983 called The Hustle. Yes. And I felt, hey, this guy has something to offer to the Calypso world. Yes. We could put together a Calypso like The Hustle. I don't know if you remember that. Well, yeah, I, I remember the song. So you could hide like an ape, but you just can't escape from the hustle. Real hustle. Now, in 1984, you came back with a tune called Ram It, which was extremely <laughs> popular in the tent. Um, a lot of um, extempo, and in fact, you even um, did a couple of verses on the judges and that sort of thing. Of Tell us what, what happened to prompt the composition of a tune like Ram It. Just a name. Just a name. You know, it, it was actually a friend gave me a joke about about Ramit. And it impacted so much on me that I said, yeah, I could write a whole song about this. So I, I, I wrote a song, you know, a whole song called Ramit. And that's when we started to see a little bit of your extempo uh, yes. ability. Yes, yes. So that, that side of your life, when did it begin, this extempo, um, let's say, talent that you have? That definitely began when I was about three years old. Definitely. I mean, you've been extempoing all your life? I have been extempoing all my life and every day of my life. Could you do a little extempo right now on this body? I moment? could extempo anytime. <laughs> I mean, that, 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 that goes without saying. Alvin, I am very glad to let you know that I love Trinidad. The truth about it, no story's been told. I have been every part of this world. I enjoy myself everywhere I go. But there's one thing I want you to know. As much as I like the world, don't mind where I go, I will always love my sweet Maya Rowe. Now, as successful as your early years of your career had been, 1985 meant a major and significant leap for you. Yes. Where do we go from here? Well, where do we go from here is a world situation. When I look at the way the whole world was going, I think that it's a question that, that you know, that need to be asked and hope that, they, that, they, that the people who matters hear it, you know. Where do we go from here? Because when you look at the way things were going at the time, you know, it, it, it looked like we were boxed in. We were boxed in and boxed in with all the wrong things. So I decided to put that together and ask that question, where do we go from here? Questions, more questions than answers In these times here yeah, Of man-made and natural disasters Questions we asking No answers we are finding But it's stranger than fiction Things we witness happening Every day we look around Well, it's more confusion the problems intensify without no solution. Helplessly man stand in his wonderland, pondering his fate at some problems he creates. So I'm asking where, where do we go from here? That 
that's my question to all mankind. Answer me where, where do we go from here? When you ever fly, man can't tell the reason why. And if I'm you that triangle, is yet still a marvel. And egotistic fanatics ruling our world. Their bombs and guns in firm control. Tell me where do we go from here? A very profound uh, calypso by you. It took you all the way to the finals. And your second tune, a nice little ditty, Suzanne. Uh, well, Suzanne had to do with a lot of things. Suzanne had to do with the people I meet on the street, some people I know very well, and the way they act. People I've known, you know, ever since they were born, and look at their progress, which amount to, to really nothing, and hope that when I put a song like Suzanne together, it would appeal to both the young people who have been misled and the people who are leading them astray at the same time you know, to do something about it. And that, that, that's, that's what brought about that whole song. Ah. Oh yeah. Where Susan come from up in the country. Everybody really surprised at she. Nobody can pinpoint where she went wrong. The girl from a good religious background. In junior sex she was doing fine Till the bright light in town blow she mind Now she forget all that she left behind Nowadays she just end up in style And living a life that's very wild The people around now forget she's still Was 1985 a sort of growing up year for you? Well, I think 1985 to me was significant, yes, and I would say that it's growing up in a way because the first time I've been, I've been to the Savannah in all my years is the first time I've made a finals. I don't know why, but it, <laughs> strange enough that it was the first time, and yeah, I felt good about it. I felt good about the two songs, as a matter of fact. But I've always been singing songs like that, Alvin. Yeah. I've always been singing songs like, exactly like that. As a matter of fact, I think that I've sung better songs than that and never go anywhere. I sang Man is Man's Greatest Enemy, which to me is one of my best songs. Well, it's a song that never really, let us say, got the accolades that it deserves, but perhaps you can give us um, the first verse so we can listen to some of the, the, the lyrics that you put into that uh, calypso. Well, I, I, hope, I hope I can remember them, Alvin, because let me tell you what I do, okay? When I have to do a show, I try to pull out some songs and rehearse them with myself. Um, I don't always remember all the songs that I write because I mean Even I, if you have to just say the lyrics of that, let me I see remember. If I well, me blood does crawl, I does hurt a ball, can't take more at all. When I watch the things what man freed, and to compare with man, all them things is lamb, man don't give a damn. He could put all them in the shade, you know man freed, lion, man freed, tiger, man freed, jaguar, the freed, the hairy spider, the things that man do too for sure, is the things that man adore. And and in my opinion, what man really should free is man. Cause the neutron bomb wasn't invented by no lion. And the nuclear bomb wasn't invented by no tiger. Oh no, no elephant or zebra. Didn't invent the B2 bomber, no. Man who invent them all by his invention. He stand tall to cause the extinction of man. So people, please see, man is man's greatest enemy. Well, we're here at your 
home in Chaguanish. How long have you been living in this home? Since 1987. And uh, why did you choose Chaguanish as a place to reside? Because it's, it's in close proximity to Port of Spain and San Fernando, where most of my major activities take place. You know, um, it's just about 20 minutes on a good day from here to Port of Spain, and same thing to San Fernando. And apart from that, where I live here is very quiet, very, very quiet, a very peaceful neighborhood. Do you do much of your composing in this home? Well, most of it. The thing about it is that this is my home, but I don't spend much time here. <laughs> <laughs> this must be the longest time I spend here in, in weeks. Mm -hmm. um, I ride on a plane, a train, a bus, a car, wherever, mm -hmm. you know. All right. Well, when last we were talking, we were talking in uh, Mayaro. We had reached as far as 1985, and you know, in 1985, you sang at the Astor Cinema with uh, Super Blue, a sort of experimental tent. Mm -hmm. And the following year started your association, the one which you still maintain with this spectacular forum. T tell us about how you managed to make that change to the spectacular tent. Well, you see, the thing about it is that um, I always like a certain amount of independence. And we wanted to, the, what, what um, Howard and Blue Boys, well, at the time Blue Boy was doing, down at, at Astor was something really good. I looked at it as something good, but it didn't work out that good. So somewhere before the end of the season, I dropped out of that. And Spectacular is the kind of tent that I had always admire, you know. That's what I thought we'd get down at Astor. That, that, that tent that has a certain professional image, you know, it, it, it's a little way from the, from the regular tent, you know. And I wanted to be in that kind of environment, so I went and talked to Martino and they, and we struck up a deal, and here I am, still with Spectacular. All right, well, 1986 was one of your biggest hits, the ship sinking. Yeah. Let us talk about the, the birth of that song in your mind, its development, and how you managed to put the whole thing together. I started writing The Sinking Ship in 1983. I started writing it first as a song called Pleasure Boat. Pleasure boat, girl, you are slowly sinking. Pleasure boat, I wonder just what you captain thinking. But then um, I started building on it, started building on it, I started building on it, and then I said, nah, the sinking ship, that was the right name. This is an SOS from the Trinidad location seven miles off the coast of Venezuela. SOS, SOS, Mayday, 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 help! The Trinidad, a luxury liner, sailing in the Caribbean Sea, with an old captain named Eric Williams. For years, sail smooth and free, but sadly, Eric William passed away. The ship hit rough water that day, someone turned the bridge over to a captain named Chimbaj. My blood call, things start to fall, hold me head when I sail I fall. Captain, the ship is sinking. Captain, the seas are rough, oh yes. We get stank almost empty, no electricity, we oil pressure really low. Shall we abandon that ship, or shall we stay on it and perish slow? We don't know, we don't know. Captain, you tell me what to do. Whoa, whoa. Trinidad, oh, she was a beauty with wealth that few surpassed. And in her day, she sailed majestically. There were few in her class. Faithfully, she fulfilled her sailors' needs. Some were overpowered by greed, and so they pilfered slow. Some took by bulk and go. Now she looked dull, she's at a lull. She could barely sit on her hull. Captain, the ship is sinking. Captain, the 
Mercies are for yes. The gas tank almost empty, no electricity. We are pressure with the law. Shall we abandon ship? Or shall we stay on it? And Paris slow. We don't know. We don't know. Captain, you tell me what to do. Your second tune, the action too high. Tell us about that as a second tune, because there were some comments in the papers that maybe if you had a stronger second tune and that sort of thing. But you see, people have their opinions, you know, and I myself, I have one. And I don't see how much stronger a song could be, you know. The action too high is a clear message. It's not confusing in any way. It's not, it's not metaphoric, as a matter of fact. It's, mm. it's, 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 it's straight up. And I couldn't understand how somebody could say that you have to be stronger than that. The action too high, you know. It is time we bring down things a little more because people are just existing on drugs, you know. And that makes for bad living. It makes for, for crime and it makes for everything else. And that's the message that I was getting across in my song. Think about the little children who look up to me and you and they think the things that we do is the things they should do to me. Oh, how badly we deceive them. They may look at us as jokes when the only thing we teach them is to sniff and jet and smoke. High, high, the action high, high. Oh, yes, high, high, the action high, high. We're drinking, smoking, or they facing something. We're facing, piping, good God, or injecting something. I tell you, they high, high, the action high, high. Oh, yes. Most of my serious songs, they are danceable. As a matter of fact, most of the songs that I sing, there's something inside it, you know, if you listen carefully enough. But we don't listen. We don't listen. Once you hear something that is not la da do ba da ba da ba doom ba ba doom and you have to wait until next year to hear the next line you tend to think that it's not, um, it's not a serious song. Mm -hmm. But that's not, the, that's not always the case, you know? I mean, the sinking ship, uh, the action too high, Suzanne, sing Rambam. These are all serious statements as far as I'm concerned, and, 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 and it's fast. It's danceable. Well, let's talk about sing Rambam as you mentioned it, because, okay, you mentioned yourself that you might have been a little disappointed with your, the, the, the position that you attained in that year with a tune as big as the sinking ship. And you made this tune, Sing Rambam, and it came across very rough at times. Tell us um, your intent in composing that calypso, because it was also able to take you all the way to the fire, so it achieved its intent. So tell us about Sing Rambam. Well, Rambam was, 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 was a song that I, I, I put together to, to, to poke fun at the establishment, frankly. You know, to, I mean, maybe you might have been involved, because you, you, you was one of the judges at the time, right? So. It was just like poking fun at, at, at the establishment, at the powers that be, you know, just saying that these people don't know what they want, they don't know what they're doing, so the best thing to do is just go up there and sing Ram Bam because... <laughs> talk about the other tune from um, that accompanied uh, Sing Ram Bam, We Need More Love, which I, I think was one of those tunes which started the season very slowly, but then again grew as the season progressed and has turned out to be like one of your trademark songs. Most certainly it is one of my trademark songs because it, it means a lot to me and it means a lot to a whole lot of people. I have this particular friend who, I mean, who really, really loved this song. You know, it's like, it's like, this is one of the songs that, that, that should be played all the time, as far as she's concerned, you know, and I really like that. I love this song too, because what this song is, is saying is that we, the world, you know, and I, 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 it, 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 not, I, I could safely say, 
total love would never be attained in our in our lifetime in my lifetime because it has never been attained in you know it has it has never exist okay but it's a song of hope you know uh, the, the kind of song that is saying listen if we could have more love then we don't need anything else because when when, when you love when you care for then there's there, there's no reason to hurt you understand you you you, you wouldn't hurt something you love so there's no there's no there's no the, the protection aspect of the whole thing is out of the question because we need more love so that's what our whole song is all about i hear clamoring in the world saying satan is in control of mankind mind body and soul may i pose this question to you do you firmly believe that's true or is people like me and you who just making the whole world blue when we show no consideration for the man that is on the ground and we act without hesitation in doing our next man wrong then we talk about evil and blaming the devil let's examine ourselves we should firmly believe no cease to rock for me to sail no mountain no mountain is too high for me to climb just to help my brother to help my brother if he needs my help no What I'm speaking of, what I'm speaking of, people, this world needs more love, we need more love, oh yeah. Okay, but the following year, we had this little episode in San Fernando, and you had gone into the competition with two nice tunes, Yesterday's Children, which was being well received in the tent, and we had The Pan, which was, um, as far as I could remember, one of the first times you had addressed this question of composing a tune specifically on the pan. Uh, tell us how you went into the competition in semi-finals and what happened on that day. I went to the semi-finals feeling very confident about the songs that, um, that I had. But um, a lot of people perceive me to be aligned with the government. I mean, this is the whole fact about the thing, okay? Even though I don't have a party card, or I am, I, I am the kind of a person that I would, I would do anything where, 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 where my country is concerned, anything that has to do with my country. I don't care who party or whatever it is. My country is my country, and that's what I would do it for. And I don't say anything that I don't believe in, you know. And before I go into Skinner Park, I was expecting some of those things. It, it didn't come totally unexpected, because a lot of people said that to me. Well, we, 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 you're saying nothing. You're the man who sings the sinking ship, and you're the one who did this, and you're the one who did that. So they want me to say things that they want to hear. But I am not that kind of person. I don't care if it costs me my life, I'm not going to say anything that I don't believe in. Unless I believe in something, I am not going to say it. So I am not going to say something just because I want somebody to laugh. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not going to get up there and say some, 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 some trivial thing then. Inside my song, there must be depth. Mm -hmm. You know, when I say something, it must, I, I, I must be convinced that what I am saying is what I mean mm -hmm. and what is factual. So. That didn't happen, even though I was singing a song that was, that is sure to happen. As long as we live, you're going to get old. The two things that has to happen in life, once you're born, you have to get old as long as you live. Mm -hmm. And you have to die. And you are going to be a child of yesterday. Yesterday's children, yesterday's children, they took Train, they felt the pain, they made the mold and shape our world. They are yesterday's children, yesterday's children. So we have to treat them good, be careful with what we do. Cause when tomorrow comes, if we are lucky, we may become yesterday's children to yesterday's children. A little stumble maybe in the fourth verse that might have compounded 
Because I think although you might not have had, let's say, the audience on your side, mm. you were coming over well. Mm. Um, what happened in that fourth verse? Can you recall? Well, what happened is that I, I realized that, listen, I was unjustly treated here. And I attempted to, and not that I could not have, say something, you know. I was actually extempore. Uh, I, st I stopped the, the I, you know, right, and I, I started extempore. But what I was about to say might have just compound, you know, the situation. So I decided, listen, I am not going to um, go any further with this. You know, so let me just forget this and consider it a bad job, mm -hmm. you know, as far as I am concerned. Yesterday, and let whatever has to be, just go ahead and be. Yesterday, children. Yesterday, children. Yesterday, children. After the whole thing and I went in to, to, to do the pan song, you know, it was like everybody still went wild. They went wild. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not my songs and it's not me, really is what they wanted to hear me say. Right. You know, because since then, I mean, we, we, we've had a very loving relationship in San Fernando, right. like we have always had. I mean, I'm a San Fernando boy myself. No, you've never actually won the, the National Monarch in Trinidad, but you were able to do Trinidad proud by going to Barbados and winning the Calypso King of the World. Tell us about that experience. Well, that to me, to this point, is the literally crumbling glory of my whole career is the first time I've been ever crowned <laughs> in, in, in any way in a, um, in a big competition. You know, apart from Niara and San Fernando, where, you know, I was crowned that and yes, I was proud the night, you know, I was proud to know that, well, here I am with all these other people from everywhere else and Trinidad and Tobago is the land of Calypso and I am, I am actually winning and, and keeping that mantle, you know, keeping that, that halo over our head as, 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 the, as the land of, of Calypso. I'm not, I'm not letting down Trinidad and Tobago in any way. Mm -hmm. So that to me was, was really good. I really liked that. Mm -hmm. I felt this is it, you know. Well, one of the things that I admire about you personally was despite your experience in San Fernando, you were able the following year to go back and face that crowd take a tune like toilet paper and have everybody in San Fernando, despite it was toilet paper, they were waving, waving with you. And uh, I, I, I really want to commend you publicly on that. Yeah. Well, my belief in life is that nothing could keep me down. I mean, I've, I've, I've believed this all my life and I believe it to this day. You know, like in one of my songs I'm doing this year, I said, I can smile through all my adversities and laugh when the guns are trained at me. And I mean that, you know, like, if you're down already, okay, the only way that you could go is up. You understand? When you're up, you have to make sure that, that you, you try as hard as you can to stay up. But once you're down, you have to make sure that you try to get up, okay? And I was looking at myself there as, as, as being down, you know? That's a hard punch, man. That's a hard punch. And since it's toilet paper that, that bring me down, then, I mean, why can't toilet paper bring me up? Anything you want to share with your fans? Well, I just want to let them know that I know that there are a lot of people out there who love me dearly, and I want them to know that I love them, and it's for them I do the things that I do, and those people who don't like me, I hope that they would get to know me better, both as a singer and as a person, and get to like me, and get to like my music, so that we could all have, you know, something in harmony going. Yeah. 
you had. I really don't know just what you think, but I believe our stage is not the place to drink. And I find you taking this joke too far. If you want to drink, you should go by the bar. Coming on stage with a glass in your hand reminds me of a long time Calypso, yeah. that the gypsy looking rather nice. Say yes. He is looking cute. Everybody see he have on a lovely suit. What I'm going to say, please don't get confused. I notice that he have an expensive shoes. What, what I'm going to say, I am making fun. I find of late he looking just like Magic Johnson. <laughs> <laughs> 